I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Russell Library at the University of Georgia and Young Harris College. We're at the Carter Center in Atlanta on Wednesday, January the 28th, 2015. Our guest is Jay Beck, Beck of the uh, center staff and a leading spokesman for the city's the center's activities. Jay, welcome. We're delighted to have you join us. Bob, thank you very much. Let's start by talking a little bit about the center and your work here. Well, the center was started when President Carter came back from Washington. Uh, been going over 30 years now and doing work all over the world in both peace and health. Uh, we've monitored over 100 elections around the world teaching democracy to emerging nations. We deal with six or eight of the worst health problems in the world, diseases that, thank the Lord, we don't have here in Georgia or America, uh, that most of our work is offshore. Uh, we do a lot of work in mental health through Mrs. Carter's interest in that. But we affect the lives of literally millions of people around the world every day uh, and have been involved in about 70 of the poorest countries in the world. How long have you been associated with uh, the center? When I moved back to Atlanta in the early 90s, uh, I had had my own business here and uh, I got a call from my friend Phil Wise that said they needed a little help here on a project. So I became a consultant here and I've been here working for uh, almost 20 years helping the center primarily raise money. I work in the development office uh, raising money for the work of the center around the world. I also get involved in some projects with President and Mrs. Carter, as sort of a utility infielder, doing various things around the center with, with primarily the focus on helping to raise money. You've known the Carters for a long time. Yes, sir. I've had that fortune. I first ran into them in the 66 governor's campaign. Uh, my friend Hamilton Jordan is up there with you in that, in that campaign. And I'd go to visit him, and I, I ran into them at that time. Uh, I actually uh, didn't really get to know them very much until later, but I did interview President Carter in 1970 when he won. I was working for the Noonan Tams Herald at that time for the Thomason family. Uh, followed Louis Grizzard onto the, which is a tough act to follow. Uh, uh, but I came up to Atlanta, interviewed him on election night, and then I would go visit Hamilton uh, in the governor's office and met a lot of the other folks, including Jody Powell and. Frank Moore and Jerry Rashoon and a lot of the mm -hmm. folks that uh, later went on to Washington with President mm -hmm. Carter. Well, you grew up with Hamilton. Tell us about Hamilton. Well, we were best friends for most of our lives. We met four years old in Sunday school, uh, went through high school together and college roommates and uh, just stayed in touch over the years. Uh, he, was an, he was an exceptional person, uh, had a great mind, uh, and a great personality and um, uh, was obviously a key influence in President Carter's success uh, and is missed by just everybody that knew him. He came from a very political family. He did. Uh, Hamilton represents probably both sides of the Georgia political spectrum. Mm -hmm. His uncle Clarence uh, started Colorama Farms and probably would would been considered the most liberal white man in Georgia at the time. And he started interracial uh, living together in the 40s and 50s, uh, and uh, there between uh, Leesburg and Smithville area, South Georgia, and uh, was terrorized by a lot of people who didn't like uh, his belief in, the, in literally taking the Bible literally. Uh, and believed that all men were created equal mm -hmm. and that uh, they had the right to live and prosper and, and, and do right. In fact, Clarence's ideas uh, later were turned into Habitat for Humanity. He had the idea to, uh, of building homes for poor people that needed homes and one of his disciples later started Habitat. And I remember going over to Hamilton's house sometimes and at night and they say, Uncle Clarence is coming by and he, he had to kind of sneak into town and visit the family <laughs> and get back home because it, it was dangerous for him to be out on the highway at night. Um, and, and he had a, a conservative side of his family uh, in, the, in, the, in the McCorder right. side of the family mm -hmm. who had been in Georgia 
politics and sports history for years. His, his family uh, were well known in the early 1900s in sports at University of Georgia. Right. And later, one of his cousins uh, was uh, my English teacher at the University of Georgia and went on to lead, the, was the head of the SEC. Mm -hmm. And uh, his family had been involved in Georgia politics back in the old county unit system and in the old days. Mm -hmm. um, so he grew up around politics in the Jordan side of the family from Talbotton, uh, had also been very successful business His people. grandfather, uh, Hamilton yeah, Ham. McWhorter, mm -hmm. uh, was president of the Georgia Senate for a number of years. Yes. And, yeah. uh, and uh, his uncle, Hamilton McWhorter, Junior was secretary of the Senate for as mm -hmm. long as I could, you know, remember. Well, absolutely, he was a great man. He was years and yeah. years and years. And another uh, cousin of his, uh, uh, Bob, Robert uh, Jordan, mm -hmm. was uh, on the chief justice of the Georgia Supreme yeah. Court. So, so he came very, by his politics. Absolutely, and, uh, very naturally. Very political family. In fact, when you go over to Hamilton's house uh, when we were kids, the discussions around the dinner table were not so much as what kind of car somebody had or what kind of dress somebody wore to a party. It was really about substantive things. They talked mm -hmm. about serious issues. And, uh, and that was a, a very enlightening thing to me, uh, to go there and listen to the discussions his mother and father and, and family would have. Is it true that Hamilton's Albany high classmates voted him most likely to become governor? You know, I don't remember that by what we did in the high school annual, but he was always involved in politics there. He, mm -hmm. he was in, in the, most of the clubs. And at the time we were in high school, he was governor of the Georgia Key Clubs. That was one of the main clubs we were involved in in high school. And uh, he, he ran and was elected governor of the Key Clubs in Georgia, which was actually probably not a bad political base for his later activities because you've made a lot of contacts with yeah. Key Clubs with young, young people all over the state. And... Uh, he, I believe he was president of the freshman class. That is correct. At University, University of Georgia, Georgia mm -hmm. which is also a source of political contacts. Mm -hmm. Well, Hamilton, I guess, first met Jimmy Carter when? In 1966? I think 1966 he went to a speech that uh, President Carter made and was impressed and went up and talked to him after that and offered to help him. And uh, at that time, Hamilton was... Uh, was uh, uh, taking off, I think, a quarter. He was spraying for mosquitoes and doing other things around South Georgia. And I think the story that I heard was uh, uh, President Carr said, well, can you help me on my campaign? He said, well, I don't know. I've got this job. And he said, listen, if I can't talk you into coming and work for me rather than going spraying for, mos spraying for mosquitoes, I don't have much of a chance. <laughs> so Hamilton left there and got involved in the campaign, as you know, and uh, helped, helped head up the youth for Carter and did a lot of things mm -hmm. around the office. Mm -hmm. And I think y'all were in the Dick LaPraza Hotel in old downtown Atlanta. I went over there to visit a couple of times and in the office, uh, Hamilton was of course there, but you had President Carter's family he was around doing things. In those days, you had old manual typewriters with the old uh, uh, they, they didn't have elect electric typewriters or computers or anything in those days. They used carbon paper mm -hmm. to make a copy of all the whatever letters they wrote. And it was, a, it was pretty primitive by today's standards. And it was a fairly uh, uh, inexpensive campaign to run. There wasn't a lot of money involved in that, right. that first effort. Yeah, but it was a great effort. It was a great effort, yes. And, and, uh, and Hamilton took a risk because uh, you may remember Jimmy Gray from Albany. Right was running also, and he was the mayor and owned the newspaper and the TV station and everything. So for Hamilton to go and work for another candidate, uh, and, and Jimmy Gray was in our class and was a good friend of ours. So for him to do that took a good risk at home for his hometown, you know, to go in and working for somebody else uh, in a race that involved uh, the mayor and a, and a good friend of his. That was a strange election. It was. Very unusual. You had... Uh the legislature choosing the governor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, in the general election, that was true. Right. Yeah. And the first time that Georgia had had a Republican candidate in Bo Calloway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, very, very interesting, interesting election. Well, uh, there was a period there when, uh, when the, that great relationship, the historical relationship between Carter and Hamilton sort of had a lull because 
Jimmy didn't win the race, but he began preparation for running the next election. Yeah. Uh, was Hamilton involved in that? Uh, you know, my memory, he went back to school and finished school. Uh, he was probably involved tangentially to all of that work, but I don't, I don't remember him being specifically and heavily involved in it, but I'm sure they stayed in touch. Mm. Uh, and he, when he finished school, he went back and then ran the 70 campaign. Right. Um, but I, you know, a after, after 66, I went into the military and, and Hamilton went into uh, a, a kind of a Peace Corps type environment and went to Vietnam uh, and worked with the tribes people over there trying to help them doing mm -hmm. things like the Peace Corps would do. It's called USAID. He got sick doing that, got some kind of illness. That uh, and and he he thought later on his exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam contributed to a lot of his subsequent illnesses mm -hmm. in later life. But they they got together again in 1970. Yes, sir. Uh, were you involved in that campaign? Um, I was not really. I like I mentioned earlier I did interview President Carter when he won that night. I was I was in the military. I got out of the Air Force in. Uh, uh, in 1970, and I went to work for the New York Times Herald, and uh, so I was not involved in the campaign at that time. Carter won. Hamilton became his executive secretary at the ripe old age of 27. <laughs> yep. A young man with a big agenda. Uh, I know you remember the Carter administration and his uh, goals. I think the First was reorganizing the government, mm -hmm. which was not an easy task. Uh, were you involved in the administration? I was. You know, Carter reorganized the Georgia government in a very successful way, right. uh, and it was one of his landmark accomplishments in state government, and he made a promise during the campaign to go and take a look at the federal government also. Mm -hmm. I got involved directly in that in Washington and was the deputy to the assistant to president for reorganization, a fellow from Florida that had done that in the state of Florida that President Carter knew. Uh, I got involved in the regulatory side. One of the first things President Carter did early on in the administration was to take all the disparate uh, department uh, agencies and entities of government that had to do both with uh, in energy and with education and combine them into a department. The way it was, they were scattered over all over different places. So they combined them so they could set policy and manage things under one entity. These were controversial things. That, mm -hmm. A lot of things that he did were not, not simple political things to do, but they've proved to be very beneficial. Uh, the Department of Energy is very successful and the Department of Education in fact, I remember during the 80 campaign and after Reagan got in, he was very critical. He said, are we going to abolish the Department of Energy? Are we going to? Well, when he got in there and found out about half of the budget of the Department of Energy had to do with the military and nuclear, uh, he said, oh, well, maybe we better, <laughs> maybe we better rethink that. But the, one of the things that came out of that was the ability to do a lot of work in energy and in setting energy policy. Um, President Carter cut the imports of foreign oil into this country in one half during his administration and did a lot of other things to set energy policy in this country for the future. I got involved though more in the regulatory side of things. Uh, I think that the setting up the Department of Energy and Education took a lot of effort, a lot of political capital, and, the, and combining other boxes didn't seem like that was going to be something to work, but I did get involved in the regulatory side. And I think being a businessman and going to Washington, both with the understanding of how government worked and understanding how business worked, realized there were a lot of areas in government where the, the regulations had been put into place, not from bureaucrats or politicians, but really business had pushed to get regulations into place because it protected their interest. Um, and a lot of things had built up over the years in that. So a lot of the regulatory reforms we did were removing a lot of the regulations that govern various businesses, from energy, where we deregulated oil and gas, to uh, communications. Uh, we opened up a lot of communications that ended up paving the road for cell phones and a lot of the other things that happened. Uh, led to the deregulation of AT&T. We started the 
the legislation and the, and the legal work that was finished in the Reagan administration to do that. But, but deregulated a lot of industries. Uh, the trucking, I was involved in the trucking a good bit, and, and uh, seafaring, a lot of things that we did, uh, banking that was very beneficial to the country. Unfortunately, a lot of the safeguards we put into place in some of those industries, oversight and management of those industries were later removed by subsequent administrations and led to some problems like the SNL crisis and other things mm -hmm. that could have been avoided if they had proper oversight. Mm -hmm. But it was a very interesting time to be there at a fairly young age and seeing you know things done that really had a, a long uh, benefit to this country. Mm -hmm. and, and quite frankly, took a long time for us to see the wisdom and, and what those benefits were. I think President Carter and Hamilton were very long-range thinking. They didn't do a lot for short political gain. They tried to do things that were good for the country and, and had great benefit because of that. One of the things that, that we did that's not very well known is did a lot of work in, in women and, uh, and diversity in government uh, that provided a lot of the groundwork for people that subsequently became, uh, you know, high-level positions, cabinet office, et cetera. Mm -hmm. so. well, let's back up for a minute and talk about, uh, first of all, uh, Governor Carter's decision to run for president. Uh, what was your reaction to that? Well, it was, it was kind of a secret for a long time, mm -hmm. as you remember. Hamilton wrote a memo in, in November of 72 that is now very famous, uh, where he laid out a pathway to do that. And a lot of the things when you read the memo seem obvious today. They weren't obvious during the political times, you know, back in, the, in late 72. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in, the, in the subsequent years, he got to travel around the country, met a lot of press people, met a lot of political people. In 74, uh, Bob Strauss appointed President Carter chair of the election committee from the DNC for that year, which had mm -hmm. formerly been just kind of a, oh, a figurehead position. You go to a couple of meetings and eat some rubber chicken. President Carter and Hamilton took that and made it into a, a, a political engine. They had briefings all over the country, had uh, training sessions for hundreds of young political operatives on how to run a campaign, how to do issues. Stu Eisenstadt got involved in those times writing position papers for this thing that was run out of the DNC, and Hamilton used that almost as a Trojan horse to go up there and meet a lot of young, bright people who later got involved in the campaign and the administration. Um, and they set up a lot of positions and, and, uh, and tried them out during that campaign. It was very successful, by the way. They had, I think 75 Democrats got elected to Congress during that year. Um, mm -hmm. So it was really one of the more successful efforts that the DNC had made. And, and they moved on from there into the campaign. And in 75, had people in the field uh, working to set up the states, particularly in early states like Iowa and New Hampshire and Florida, where those key early victories are so important to the mindset of the electorate and the media. Uh, they had people in the field early on, and President Carter and his wife and his kids and other relatives were out campaigning all the time. And, and having left the governor's office in 74, offered that opportunity to get out and do that. They did it on a shoestring. I mean, the budget for Iowa was under $20,000 for the whole campaign, which, uh, and coming out of Iowa being the top vote getter in Iowa, slingshotted into uh, New Hampshire, and he won that, went to Florida, and, and was off to the races. So, I mean, it, it took a lot of thoughtful planning um, on Hamilton's part and great implementation and they were very good about being frugal with money. President Carter's always been very frugal about spending money, but uh, the campaign uh, w was painfully frugal in not hiring people. People volunteered for a long time. They did without. The Peanut uh, Brigade. Peanut Brigade, yeah. Uh, Dot Padgett and, and uh, Nancy Koningsmart, who was Hamilton's wife at the time, and Rita Thompson got involved putting the peanut brigade together. They would go out, but people would volunteer, left their homes and businesses and spend a week on the road stomping around the snows of New Hampshire and going to Iowa and going to all other kind of other places, campaigning and working for President Carter. And it was a novelty at the time for people, particularly in New Hampshire or Iowa, to see these people that talk like I do <laughs> coming into town uh, 
wearing funny hats and, and, uh, and saying, you need to vote for this guy. He's our governor. He's done a great job, and I'm here because I believe in him. That was, that was very impressive, and, mm -hmm. and it really provided the, the ground troops in a lot of ways to help. And then hiring local people out of the political entities there uh, mm -hmm. to help uh, bolster the campaigns in various counties was very effective. And uh, it's been followed by everybody since. I mean, President Carter essentially put Iowa on the map, mm -hmm. um, going there and having that impressive victory over a lot of the, the, there were five or six other political candidates in the race, senators and things like that, who had better name recognition right. around the country, but they got caught flat-footed. Right. So he's elected president. He goes through the transition process, and then he builds a staff. Let's talk about some of his inner circle, mm -hmm. including well, I think, you. Well, I, I was a... I was a very small clog in the inner circle, but I think that the key people that, came, that went to Washington had had a long time experience with President Carter. You had Hamilton, you had Jody Powell that did the media, Jerry Rafshoon in communications, you had Bert Lance who he came out of the transportation office in, in Georgia, but also had a lot of uh, financial and, and budget background. Jim McIntyre, who also was in the office here, Richard Hardin, who had the administrative part of Georgia government. You had a core group of people, Stu Eisenstadt, who did the position papers and, and did the issues in Washington. That core group of eight or ten people came out of Georgia and, and took similar positions in Washington. And because they'd worked together for almost ten years in some cases, they knew each other well. They didn't have the turf battles and the ego problems that you run to see in a lot of administrations. They all got along, they weren't backbiting. When they had a problem, they raised their hand and said, I need some help here with this thing. Most of them, and particularly Hamilton, one of the strengths that Hamilton had and a lot of these folks had, they knew their strengths and they knew their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And they, a lot of people you'd run across in politics bluster their way to try to do things and when they have a problem, they, they think because they're smart in one area, they're smart in every area. Mm -hmm. And I think the people around President Carter always said, I need some help here. And so they would go to these colleagues or, in the case in Washington, hired a lot of other very bright and capable and experienced people mm -hmm. in Washington to come in and help out with those things where they needed the help. But I think the core group that, that was together uh, knew how to get things done and knew how to support each other and had that kind of camaraderie that you need. And it's not uncommon. President Reagan, George W. Bush, uh, Clinton, a lot of those people, you look at them, there was a core group, and it may have been three or four, but there was a core group of people that went to Washington with them that they trusted, they had each other's backs, mm -hmm. and they used them in a, in, a, in a strong and powerful way to get things done. Were you insulted when the media referred to you as the Georgia Mafia? No, that's, that was just the media. You know, you got to look back in those days, uh, there was gossip columns were, were had prominent places in the newspapers. Uh, that it was, it was, it's compared to today, it was probably mild <laughs> what goes on with the, because the politics has gotten so insular and, and divided. But in those days, uh, a lot of people did gossip. A lot of people would float uh, criticism. And, and it happened, and you just had to let it roll off your back. It wasn't a big deal, because it wasn't true. I mean, the, the, the people that came in to head the cabinet offices and things like this, and the second level people and all the staffs were people who basically were very experienced in Washington. They came off the Hill, they came off of other interest groups, they came off of other departments and agencies. So you had a, again, a core group of people to help direct policy and set policy, but you had a lot of other people with experience to carry it out. And quite frankly, you know, when you look at like Frank Moore, uh, Frank got a lot of criticism because Hamilton, they would say, well, Hamilton doesn't return phone calls from Congress. Well, that was on purpose. I mean, Frank ran the Congress. Mm -hmm. And if Hamilton had taken the phone calls, they would have gone around Frank's. But Frank was the guy that did that. We passed 80% of all the legislation we sent up to the Hill. There's only like one or two maybe administrations in history that have passed more. And yet the press and the gossips and all that would report that a different story. But it was there because they had a tight team that worked together and knew how to get things done. Well, 
as we look back, uh, history was not very kind to President Carter during his term. He had uh, uh, a crisis or two that uh, he had to deal with that uh, certainly uh, were controversial. Uh, one was the hostages. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, and perhaps you can enlighten me on what was going on behind the scenes during that period of time. Well, not specifically in that, because that really more was a national security issue, and I wasn't involved in that. But there were a lot of issues that went on during that time. Sometimes, when you're president, the, you, you're you, sometimes you're lucky to have a good time of history to be there. The stock market's going up, and more jobs being. And sometimes you're not. I think when he was there, a lot of things in the world that he had no control over happened. You know, you had a lot, of, you had the oil crisis going on, you had the Iran situation, you had a lot of things happening that were beyond the control of the president or government to deal with, but you got to still handle them. And they did a good job of it. They handled things, and I think if you look back, and uh, I think if you look back with history, President Carter is seen in a, in a much more favorable light than he was at the time, because it's just, it's kind of a natural, national pastime to be critical of your presidents and people in office. That's sort of a, you know, something we kind of enjoy doing in many ways. But when you look past that and you get into what the substance that happened and the things that were achieved, it's a very dramatic administration in terms of accomplishments. Uh, I, think, I think the record is stand up on those four years up against pretty much anybody. Mm -hmm. Let's get back a minute for a minute to Hamilton. Yeah. The 1980 election, of course, uh, uh, resulted in President Carter not returning to office. Uh, what happened to Hamilton after that? Well, after that, Hamilton wrote a book, a, na a bestseller called Crisis. And the book was about the last year of the Carter presidency and dealt primarily with the hostage situation and in the campaign. Uh, and he, the book did very well. Uh, he moved back to Atlanta. He got married to Dorothy Henry, uh, and they settled in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and built a house. He became a, worked in business, doing strategic planning and things for the business, and uh, continued to do that. Dorothy, uh, because she was a pediatric oncology nurse, she just, uh, just uh, founded Camp Sunshine, which is ongoing camp for children with cancer here. Um, and Hamilton was involved in a support role for that. Um, so they moved back to Georgia and settled here and, uh, and it, it started a family. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Hamilton continued to do consulting in a national and international way uh, from Georgia. He also did uh, some politicking. Yep, occasionally did some politicking, got involved. A lot of people would come to Hamilton asking him for help and advice on various things. And, uh, and he was very generous about spending time doing that. One of Hamilton's great gifts was ability to explain something that was complicated in a way that was comprehensible. And he would make charts and graphs and do bullet points. And he could take something and, and lay it out to people in a way that made sense. One of the things he got involved in um, in the 84, no, the 88 election, it was later on, was trying to keep the Democratic Party focused on the importance of the South. And looking back on that, he was very prescient in his concern that mm -hmm. their Democratic Party was going to lose the South by taking positions that were too liberal for a lot of uh, Southern politicians. And, uh, and I think he, he, he really, if you could, if you could have kept the South competitive in national elections, the, the, the landscape would have been a lot different today. Mm -hmm. But he got involved in various, various elections and things. And, and uh, he, he uh, uh, was involved in international politics as well as domestic, and then worked for a company called Sawyer Miller out of, out of New York uh, doing advice. Uh, in 85, uh, he got cancer himself, lymphoma, and went up to the National Institutes of Health and was treated successfully. And after that, and during that time leading up to that, he had been looking around and trying to find somebody to run for the U.S. Senate, and Herman Talmadge was going to leave. And uh, Weiss Fowler, who, who won the seat, was running. And Hamilton thought, as a lot of people did in Georgia, that Weiss's voting record was too liberal to be elected in Georgia. 
and you had Mattingly, I'm sorry, you had Mattingly in there at that time, and uh, they thought that uh, he could be beat because he was an ineffective senator, mm -hmm. largely. Um, so Hamilton had been trying to encourage other people to run, and nobody jumped into it. So after spending several months in 84, 85 looking at that, and after he was cured of his cancer, he said, well, I'll just do it if nobody else will. He jumped into the race and a very, at a late time, he was still bald and puffy from treatments and ran a respectable race, which Weish won in the Democratic primary and he immediately turned around and supported Weish. And with a lot of pull from a lot of folks, including some of the folks in the legislature, uh, Weish won and uh, was, uh, you know, the, the beat, beat Maddeny and became senator. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Jody Powell. Yeah. Well, Jody was a, a brilliant at handling the press, great personality, uh, great mind, and uh, another great loss to our country. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know Jody as well in Washington as I got to know him later, but he was, he was probably, if not the most popular and best press secretary ever, certainly one of the top two or three ever. Uh, he did a great job and was very well respected in Washington. Bert Lance. Bert was a tremendous guy, uh, very capable. Uh, got caught up in a problem in Washington from banking days that a lot of people had similar circumstances, but it got blown, I think, somewhat out of proportion by the media and he had to leave. But Bert was a tremendous individual, uh, a man of great caring and humor and ability, uh, and it was a big loss for us losing him because he was a, he was a great voice working with the business community in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, he, was, he was very much accepted as a peer by people in Wall Street and the business community, and losing him was a big, was a big hit. There's a name that very few people would recognize who I think was one of Jimmy Carter's greatest mentors and his name is Charlie Kerbo. Mm -hmm. Did you know Mr. Oh, Kerbo? Oh, terrific, terrific man. I didn't know him well, but he, he was a wonderful man. And he and Hamilton got along very well. I mean, Kerbo came out of the political history of Georgia in a way that he knew the McWhorter and Jordan families. And uh, even though there was a good bit of age difference involved, they got along very well. And Charlie Kerbo helped President Carter when he first ran for the state Senate. You may remember the election. They tried to steal the election from him in South Georgia when you had people in Fort Gaines, a lot of them who, who had been dead for a number of years, cast mm -hmm. their ballots proudly, and then a number of the rest of them voted in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> and so they challenged that, and, and Charlie Kerbo was the lawyer that challenged that in the courts and got it thrown out, which is what put President Carter in as a state senator. And, uh, so they had had a long relationship too, but Charlie Kerbo was a brilliant mind, uh, a great, great guy and a great advisor, both to President Carter and Hamilton and others in the administration. What is President Carter up to nowadays? He just doesn't slow down. You know, he turned 90 uh, in last October. He travels all over the world uh, working on the issues of the Carter Center. Uh, he got back from China two or three weeks ago from a 10-day visit. Uh, he goes and works in the Middle East tirelessly. He's got another book coming out. He's written like about 30, over 30 books. And Mrs. Carter's written five or six. They're, they're tireless in what they do. And uh, he's uh, proud of the work at the Carter Center and is keeping that going uh, with the relationships he has around the world and his ability to inspire all of us to work to our best to try to help people. Mm -hmm. As you know, Jay, the media in particular, politicians and the general public focus on the Oval Office. So it takes a, a quite an individual, first of all, to be President of the United States and keep peace and quiet, but also a staff that's able to carry out the President's orders. Uh, successfully. And I think Hamilton was a good example of that. Yeah. Well, I think Hamilton brought to that job some, some key components of his personality. Not only was he a great analytical mind, 
was a wonderful writer, and, and he, could, he could write memos and give direction that was simple to understand, had a had a end result, uh, and that people could follow, uh, you know, easily. Uh, but he came to it with a personality that people wanted to please. They wanted, they wanted, they respected him. He respected people that worked for him. Uh, he he didn't micromanage people. If they made a mistake, he would jump in and, and correct it. But he, gave, he respected the people that worked for him, and they respected him in return by giving them the, the, the chance to achieve something that they would give them a direction, let them go out and do it in their own way. Uh, you, you build tremendous trust that way. And he had people's trust. Um, people people wanted, to, wanted to do a lot of things because of the kind of person Hamilton was because of the, the generosity with which he dealt with people, the lack of ego, the willingness to give credit to others. Uh, he didn't care about the limelight. He wanted other people to get the limelight. Um, and he did it with a great sense of humor. I mean, Hamilton was a really funny guy, and he loved to tell jokes and stories and play pranks on people. But he did it in a such a way that in trying to get something done, it took the tension out of it. And it took a lot of the, uh, a lot of people who do management by command and by bullying and things of that nature. You might get something done short term because people are afraid of you, but it doesn't work very well in the long term. Hamilton's ability to manage and lead uh, created an inspiration that people wanted to continue do th doing things the best they could, not only because it was the right thing to do, because, because Hamilton wanted them to do it. And he inspired that kind of loyalty. And that's a, that's a rare thing in a leader and a manager. And it's something that uh, more people in government should try to aspire to. Hamilton once said that uh, the, the, the Carter administration never did anything for political reasons. Uh, who presided over the president's politics? Well, Hamilton was the key person presiding over the politics because you're in a political environment in Washington and the White House. A lot of people had input into that. But Hamilton was generally the person who wrote the last memo, who assimilated the input of everybody. Uh, Carter always liked to have things, and he wanted more than one opinion. He wanted opposing points of view. And, and in doing that, people would say, this is, this is what I believe in, and these are the pros and cons of what I believe in. And you'd get a lot of those things together and then sort through it and try to move toward the best decision. Hamilton was the assimilator of those things. I mean, a lot of people would give President Carter their ideas and opinions, but Hamilton was the one, the last guy in the room, essentially, uh, to come and make, make a presentation, why that was politically useful. The good thing about Hamilton, he didn't get involved if it was a matter of some, you know, some legal issue or something else. He would, he would say, I don't have any... I don't have any background in that. He'd let somebody else do that. But it was a matter of how it would affect things politically. He would get involved in it. Mm -hmm. And he would make his opinion known to President Carter. He would give him pros and cons. He'd say, you know, if you do this, this will happen. If you do this, this will happen. And then President Carter would make a choice. He didn't always choose the thing that was most politically beneficial to him because it was some, he wanted to get something done that was mm -hmm. tough, you know, oftentimes controversial, oftentimes, you know, was, was counter to his popularity, but he did it because the right thing for the country. The Panama Canal Treaty is a perfect example of that. Several presidents had tried to get something done with the Panama Canal Treaty. President Carter took it on and made it happen, and he did it. It was very difficult, very controversial at the time, but it was a great success and is a great success today. Uh, but he did it because, out of determination. He didn't get a lot of people saying, oh boy, we need to go, <laughs> we need to go and do something really controversial. He did it because it was the right thing to do. And the Panama Canal is a great success today. Whereas when, back in the days when the U.S. government was running it, it was really kind of experiment socialism in a lot of ways. You had a federal government, an entity of, of the government who owned, managed, staffed, ran uh, a business, a, a and that's kind of the definition of socialism in a way. And uh, President said, this is not right. Let's, let's, uh, let, we want to give it back because it's the right thing to do. And it was, uh, there was a uh, contract with Panama, a treaty that was signed like 100 years before it was due to expire. 
And so they said, let's go ahead and get this done now. No point in waiting a few years for this clock to run out on this. It was the right thing to do. And what, it, what happened by doing the Panama Canal Treaty, not only was it the right thing to do for the country in Panama, it opened up all of Central and South America to a whole different opinion of the United States, who had been seen by some as a very dictatorial bully and opened us up to say, these are guys you can deal with. And these are, and his human rights policy helped a lot of people in Central and South America, some of whom later came to run those countries. And they would come back here, President, he'd come here in the Carter Center, he'd seen people who said, I was in jail uh, as a dissident, and your human rights policy helped me get out of jail and helped me to leave my country today. I mean, so uh, it, was a, it was a huge thing to do, and it was very far-sighted, and it was one of the examples of taking on something that wasn't politically popular, but doing it because it was the right thing to do. How closely did the president study polls? Not so much. He would look at them like anybody would, but polling in those days was much less sophisticated in some ways than it is today. Today, there's many nuances involved in polls. I mean, he would look at polls and see what they were and listen to various opinions that people would have, you know, giving polls to him and what the results meant. Uh, but he would go ahead and form his opinions not based on what the polls were. He would, he would do it based his opinions and do things because what it, he thought was the right thing to do. In many cases, you know, if you'd run a poll in the Panama Canal, it, It'd have been like 90 to 10, don't do this. Right. You know, but that was just one of example where he did things because it was the right thing to do. Uh, let's spend a minute on 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened? You mean during the whole year in the politics of the campaign? or The what? campaign. Well, obviously there was a lot of issues going on. I think Iran was one of the key problems uh, and the economy uh, that had a lot of effect on the political situation. And... Both of those were curiously things that you couldn't do too much about. There were some things you could, you could work on, but they were outside of the framework of being able to pull a lever in Washington and make something happen. What President Carter did do with Paul Volcker is sit down and say, what do we have to do to fix the inflation and everything else that's going on? And Volcker said, we're going to have to raise interest rates, and it'll be very unpopular, but it will be the thing to do to wring this economy out of inflation and get us back on the right path. And Carter said, yo, let's go, let's do it. It was the right thing to do. He did, it was very unpopular uh, and, and had a, a bubble there for several years where people felt very unsettled, but it wrung the economy out. And, uh, and today it's seen as, as one of the great economic decisions uh, of the last hundred years. Uh, I think with Iran, what could you do? We, we tried to do a rescue mission based on the best military advice of the time and equipment of the time, and it was unsuccessful. Uh, there were a lot of reasons that have since become uh, declassified why it would have worked had, uh, had, you know, thing, had the helicopters made it, um, but it didn't work. And so you had nightly news, particularly if you remember the ABC News had a, had a countdown every night. Uh, of what, what's gone on in Iran today. So you had that mm -hmm. clock ticking, you had dissatisfaction with the economy and, and kind of a frustration over our inability to be able to do something about Iran when there really wasn't much you could do. I mean, you could go in there and nuke them, but that was, I mean, President Carter's idea, let's get the hostages out, let's get our people home. And that was foremost in his mind. And it cost him politically not to do another military mission or something, but he got them all out. And people forget that he got them all out, uh, and they they waited. When Reagan was elected, he waited till, and he and Iran waited until after Reagan had been sworn into office, and then the plane took off from Tehran. Uh, but he got them back, and those people didn't Are lose. You their say lives. you think that was a conspiracy? That's what the books of, in history have said. It's not my, okay. it's not my uh, uh, knowledge or ability to do that. But in reading history books, that's what a lot of them have said. And so if you look at the timetable of how things happened, the plane's sitting on the tarmac for a while, I mean, you can make some assumptions based on that. Right. Uh, the politics of the campaign in 1980 were exacerbated by, by Teddy Kennedy's challenge of President Carter. Uh, I think he saw erroneously an opening 
given all the problems the country was having. And when he ran, I think he assumed he was going to be a lot more popular than he was. Um, when, uh, when he did that and we got involved understanding the primary processes as well as President Carter did, we knew that we were going to be successful in the primaries against him, and that was the case, and he ended up being unsuccessful in his challenge. But the problem was he continued a, a kind of a guerrilla campaign up to the convention of trying to switch voters' minds and change people who had already pledged to President Carter to go to him and doing other challenges to the platform that drew out the process of confrontational politics that normally in a, in would have been over and you'd have had a chance to heal the party of wounds in a, in a challenge like that. that. That continued for months and on into the convention and was very disruptive, cost money, time, uh, efforts. Uh, and uh, by the time the convention was over, you only had a couple of months then to repair everything. And it was damaging. It was, it was very damaging to the election. Another thing that happened that was also wearing in the general election is one of the Republican uh, primary candidates, John Anderson, uh, became an independent suddenly with a lot of funding from people who had traditionally supported Republican candidates. And he then decided he was going to take on the environment as, as his prime issue. So he ran primarily being the, uh, like a Green Party candidate and cut in to a lot of the votes that would have normally gone to President Carter. And the irony of that is President Carter was probably the best environmental president since Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and yet a lot of the people that Anderson would appeal to because he would agree with everything they had to say. And you know when you're dealing with people on a, on a particular issue, they want you to agree with them on 100% and often you can't do that. And they liked the people that do agree with them 100%, which he did. And, and President Carter and the Carter campaign was trying to be more realistic about things. And, and again, the record President Carter had on the environment was just un, unparalleled. Uh, but he, he cut in a good bit in, in the election and took away a lot of those votes that would have been uh, made it a closer election than it was. And I think that and the media attention, particularly with the hostage, the anniversary of the hostage crisis coming up on election day, uh, that compounded to be a, uh, something that you just couldn't overcome. Mm -hmm. Well, Jay, it's been a pleasure talking All with right, you. All right, sir. We'll get Phil back in here.